morning. Welcome to our Sunday worship gathering. Our hope and prayer is that you would um, find something in this service, in this, this gathering, whether you're listening to it Sunday morning or, or whenever you end up hearing it. Uh, we're a community that wants to focus on what matters most. And what we believe matters most is, is learning who Jesus is, trusting him and following him. Um, the other things we believe that matter most are, are looking at the scriptures that teach us about him. We believe there is this good word, this good text that tells us all about Jesus and all about God and all about ourselves. Um, and we also uh, use this time to just praise and worship God. Um, there's, there's all kinds of people that might be listening today and, and um, many of us in our church gatherings are from different places, different backgrounds, um, but we're united in this belief that God is good and that Jesus is a great King and Lord and Savior and He loves the downcast and the brokenhearted and He binds Himself to the poor and the widows and the orphans and he, ah, He's a God of love and justice and of mercy and He's strong and good and powerful and, and many of us have come to know Him and trust Him. We want others to know too and, and we're a grateful community that loves and cares for each other in response to the love and grace and goodness of God. I'm going to open with a word from the Psalms, uh, one of the books in the scriptures that, that just sing the praises of God, and then we'll spend time uh, singing him, singing to him, and singing about God and his goodness. And then, um, and then I have a message today on why studying the scriptures are so important and, and how, to, how to go about doing that. So hear this good word from Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I'll give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of honor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He provides food for those who fear him. He is ever mindful of his covenant. He has shown his people the powers of his works. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. He, has, he sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. Praise the Lord. His praise endures forever. Let's praise him now. Oh 
follower I would be For by His hand He leadeth me
are beautiful beyond description yet God crushed you for my sin in agony and deep affliction cut off that I might enter in who can grasp such tender compassion who can fathom this mercy so free you are beautiful beyond description Sean and Ricky loved picking out cool vintage clothing to sell online. And one day in 2014, they picked up an old West Point sweater at a Goodwill store for around 50 cents. A bit later, the two of them happened to be watching a documentary about a legendary football coach, uh, Vince Lombardi, the longtime coach of the Green Bay Packers, and the name of the Lombardi Trophy, the Super Bowl trophy. And they noticed he appeared to be wearing the same sweater. Sure enough, uh, they found Lombardi's name written inside the sweater they had purchased. They got it authenticated and they sold it for $43,000. There was a British woman named Thea and she bought a sparkly brooch for about 30 bucks in 2011. She thought it'd be a cool addition to her four-year-old daughter's toy box. She gave it to her daughter and the girl wore it to school and on errands and no, much, no one thought much about it. They assumed it was costume jewelry surrounded by fake diamonds. Uh, but an appraiser came one day to uh, value Thea's engagement ring for insurance. And as she was there, she noticed the gem. And she said, it turns out it was a royal gem once worn by a Russian Tsarina. And Thea was able to sell it for $43,000. There's a woman named Terry who bought a huge, ugly painting for $5 as a gag gift to cheer up her friend in 1992. She thought, the, though the friend thought it was hilarious, she had no room for it, so Terry took it back home. She tried to unload it at a garage sale, but an art teacher told her that she should check it out to make sure it wasn't a Jackson Pollock painting. So Terry ultimately hired a forensic specialist who found a fingerprint from Pollock, and he was able to trace the paint back to Pollock's studio. She's been offered $9 million for the painting, but she wants $50 million. Sometimes we stumble upon hidden treasure. Sometimes we have more than we think right in front of us and we just don't recognize it. Today we're gonna to talk about hidden treasure that we are all in possession of, or that we at least all have access to. There's a, a greater treasure offered to us by God, by his church community that is available for us all the time. And this treasure has more value and power to really change us and transform us. See, the treasure these people found, they were, they were pretty cool. 
And they sold them and made a lot of money, and it was financial treasure. The treasure we all have available to us is the scriptures. Christians confess that this, this Bible, uh, the scriptures that we have is an inspired word, an inspired witness to who God is, to his action in history, to what he believes about mankind and his creation, and, and all the things that he calls and invites and requires of mankind. Now, I believe as, as a pastor of this, of this church community that Jesus is the word of God, and the scriptures that we have are also the word of God. It's the main source we go to again and again, along with prayer and, and Christian community, but it's what we go to again and again to understand and to learn about God and ourselves. And whether you personally think it's true or the word of God or inspired, it has been received, read, and understood as the word of God, as an inspired word for several thousand years from all kinds of people across all continents and all eras. This book plays everywhere. It inspires and transforms people everywhere from Rome in 100 AD to South Africa in 1950s, to the Philippines, to China, to Honduras, to South America and to the Americas. It continues to speak and inspire and transform as it points people to God and shows people what it means to be human. And we read it, Christians read it in order to be transformed, to know God and ourselves on a deeper level. We read it to know uh, what to do with our lives, how to respond to God and how to live. There's a treasure here that can help you, that can inspire you and change you. There's treasure here that can change the world. This is an unjust, unmerciful world that needs the justice, the mercy, the ways of God's kingdom that are spoken about in these stories and in these texts. There are words of challenge here calling us to love the poor and care for the needs of the marginalized. There is grace, truth, and challenge here. It's not a safe book, it's not an easy book, but it's a powerful word that can move us and move the church and move God's ways forward. And we're gonna talk about how to approach these scriptures today. To, to pull back just a little bit and to remind you or tell you where we've been, or what we've been doing this year, we've been talking about how to have a rule of life or a way of life like Jesus. These messages this year are called to, to become more like Jesus. And to do that, we're to have a Jesus following life. We've been looking at certain practices of Jesus um, and we've been teaching about them and we're trying them out. But the ultimate goal is that we would move forward as a community and form these Jesus practices and make them our way of life. Uh, and, and jump off the way of life we've been given in, in this world and all the, all the things that come at us and tell us, live this way. Instead, move into a deeper and deeper living in the ways of Jesus. And we've looked at prayer and times of silence so far. We talked about how Jesus prayed and Jesus found communion with his Father through prayer and silence and Jesus was strengthened by prayer and Jesus believed in praying for God's justice and love to break through. And, and we're called to have that in our life. And now we're talking about the practice of studying and meditating upon the scriptures. There's transforming good treasure here for each and every one of us, for our church. Uh, but many of us, myself included at times, we try to treat it like a thrift store find, right? It's a nice piece of jewelry to wear once in a while, or, or it's a cool sweater, or it's an interesting painting. And the answer to that is, the response to that is no. It's a priceless garment to put on every day. No, it's an antique, priceless piece of jewelry handed down in your family that you get to possess. It's the painting that becomes the centerpiece of your living room. And so often we leave it in the attic or in the closet or in the jewelry box, but it's a treasure that's to be used. But whatever you believe about God, there is something here in these texts. I'm not trying to prove it to you. I'm inviting you to read this book and see for yourself. Two weeks ago, we started talking about how important these scriptures are to Jesus and how they should be in our rule of life. Two weeks ago, I said that the text is our family history. We looked at some stories from Jesus and he saw it as his family history. Um, he saw it as a story of, of his father and his people and it's ours as well if we're a follower of Jesus. Jesus used the first half of the book to guide how he lived in everyday life. Now, Jesus, again, whatever you believe about him, he's the, one of the most famous and influential figures in human history. And he believed this was the word of God that he needed to live his life. And last week, I gave three holy postures. We looked at Jesus' best disciples in the Gospels, Mary, 
uh, the sister of Martha, and then a woman named Mary Magdalene. And we saw their posture. Mary sat and listened to the feet, at the feet of Jesus. Martha clung and embraced the feet of Jesus and then went and told people about him. We looked at these Marys and said, yes, they are receiving words from Jesus, but they give us a good example of how to receive the scriptures. And last week, the three holy postures were sit and listen. We're to let the text really impact us and sit and listen to it. We said embrace. We said that when you read the scriptures, you should commit to it emotionally. Christ is your savior, your Lord. He loves you and he wants you. Imagine Mary in the garden. Put yourself there when you study the text, embracing Jesus. And then I said, go and tell. Our time with God in scripture and prayer should issue forth into going and telling and living in the words and deeds uh, of Jesus. This week is part two of last week. We're looking at a one more Mary, Mary, the mother of Jesus. And again, she's going to hear words from messengers of God and from Jesus. And we're going to look at how she responds to these words. Um, and these words are going to be great holy postures for us as we read the scriptures. So what I'm saying today is look at her. She's an exact, excellent example of how to be a follower of Jesus and how to commit to the scriptures that point us to Jesus. So there's something good for us if we follow her example. All right. So I'm going to share a few stories uh, and most, and actually the first two stories I'm going to share all come from, actually the first few stories I'm going to share all come from the early chapters of Luke. In the first two chapters of Luke, we have the Christmas story, right? If you've gone to church at all on Christmas Eve, you've probably at least heard this story, right? It's a long story about the ins and outs of the birth of Jesus. And I'm going to give you this super quick version so I can point us to something the author of the Gospel of Luke wants to show us about Mary. So Mary is to have a child. They have to go to Bethlehem, Mary and Joseph, Joseph's hometown, to be taxed. And that's when Jesus is born in a manger because there's no room in the house or the inn, right? So there's this, all the world to be taxed, go to Bethlehem, have the baby, right? And then this next thing happens, these angels show up because the shepherds told them all about, or these angels show up and tell these shepherds all about the birth of Jesus, peace on earth, goodwill to men. And the shepherds go run and see Jesus, Mary and Joseph. Now, this is Luke 2.16. Hear these words. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in a manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about the child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. All right, next scene. A few days after this, Mary and Joseph go to Jerusalem there's a, a Jewish ritual uh, in the scriptures that, that they were taught to do. When the firstborn son is, is born, you present them to the Lord in the temple and you offer a sacrifice. So they, they go to Jerusalem, I believe eight days later, after the birth of Jesus. And there they see these two kind of prophet people, Simeon and Anna, and they're waiting for this righteous one. And Simon cries out after seeing Jesus, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And in this scene, it says, the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Simon blessed the child and spoke to Mary, he said, this child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed uh, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Now again, we see Mary is pondering. She's amazed. We see that she's looking and observing what's being said about Jesus. After this, Luke 2 concludes with a third story, a last story of Jesus as a child. And we talked about it a few weeks ago. Uh, the family's in Jerusalem for a festival when Jesus is 12. His whole family, including cousins, aunts, and uncles, their whole clan, returns to Galilee, but Jesus stays in Jerusalem. And Mary and Joseph don't realize this for a day or so, and they go looking for him, and they can't find him for three days. And they find him. And they say, you know, we're worried. What are you doing? And Jesus says, why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. And this line, his mother 
treasured all these things in her heart. So we have these three scenes that each kind of conclude or close to conclude with Mary treasuring, Mary treasuring and pondering, Mary amazed. Now, Luke is a long book. In fact, the papyrus couldn't be much longer to be transported, just the way you, you carried books back in the day. So every word mattered. And it was essential to point. It was essential to Luke to point to what Mary did with all these words from God and all these tellings of the work of God. Luke wants us to see what she is doing with all these words she's learning about Jesus. There's a shepherd testimony, a wise old man and a woman testimony, and the testimony from the boy Jesus himself. And Mary takes it and she ponders and she treasures. It's the first holy posture when you come to the scriptures. Ponder and treasure. Keep these words that you're reading, that you're being taught in the middle of your life. You might be thinking, and we, we, yes, I, I spend some time in the Word, but I have a busy life and there's so much going on. Yeah, l- look at the busyness of Mary in chapter 2. She's traveling and paying taxes and traveling while nine months pregnant and prepping for the birth of a child and then traveling with a newborn. Can you feel the amount of busyness and work that involves? She's taking a newborn to church. Can you feel that? Do you remember experiencing that? Or maybe you're experiencing that now. She's traveling with a ton of family. And all of that busyness, the text points out, she's pondering and treasuring. Don't box your scripture time off from the rest of your life. Ponder and treasure it in the busyness of your life. Keep it with you. Luke is saying to us, recognize what you have here. Look at Mary. She gets it. You now have the story in your hands. Do you get it? This paper, this Bible app, or these words on a page have way more value for your life than you think. This isn't just old paper. This isn't just old words written a while ago. It's it's like kintsugi that we've been talking about. It's shot with gold and silver and platinum. Do you know what you have in here? Treasure it. Ponder it. That treasure and ponder means you're, you're holding on to it. It's still being digested. It's still being pondered in your head throughout the day. So that's the first holy posture. The next holy posture, we're going to go back to when Mary first finds out about Jesus. And I'm going to read Luke verses 1, 26 to 38 and note Mary's posture here because it's so good. Pick it up in verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great. He'll be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He'll be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who has said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. I think how Mary responds in this story is a perfect picture, a wonderful example of how we might engage the scriptures that we have. Let's walk through the scene. The angel Gabriel shows up with wild news, right? Greetings, favor one, the Lord is with you. So Mary's encountering a revealed word of God, right? And for us today, when we we read the scriptures, if you're a Christian, if you're a committed follower of Jesus, you believe that you're encountering a revealed word from God. The story says she was much perplexed and pondered. 
or she's wrestling with what's going on. When you read the scriptures, it's okay to be perplexed and wrestle with what's going on. It's okay to be confused. It's God who really, if it's God who really communicates and it, it makes sense to not always understand. Mary doesn't think she knows it all. She's perplexed. This is disruptive information. It's outside the norm. It's new. It's disorientating. So she's wrestling with it. She's perplexed. She's confused. You, you can be that way as you read the scriptures. The angel says, do not be afraid. And my guess is he saw her face and body language and that she was afraid. It's, it's okay to be afraid when you read the scriptures and learn about God. It's okay to be afraid as you think about God and humanity and the world and all the big stuff in these scriptures. Mary asks questions. How can this be, <laughs> right? It's okay to have questions. It's okay to read the scriptures and be like, how can this be? In fact, it's really, really good to read the scriptures and have lots and lots and lots of questions. You're not to turn your brain off when you read the scriptures. You don't have to become a simpleton when you read the Bible. Look at Mary. She's perplexed. She's pondering. She's questioning. That is wonderful. God gave her a brain. God gives you a brain. God made you in his image. Use all he's given you when you learn and read and consider the Christian faith and the words laid out in the scriptures. So do all of that. Be perplexed, have questions. Let the fears come up, do all of it. But look at her final word in this story. Look to her final analysis of the whole matter. She says, here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. This posture of receiving and obeying is where Mary ends up. This is going to be difficult for her. This is going to be difficult for us when we read the scriptures. It's going to be this wrestling match for our whole life in society, right? The water we swim in in our world today is that man is the measure of all things. Uh, Protagoras, an ancient Greek philosopher, said that. We believe, I think, therefore I am. It's our brain that's the final authority. It's our autonomous self that's the final authority. It's our perspective that's the final authority. It's, it's everything that's flowed at us in the advertising world. It's you, you, you are the final authority. And we live in a, an age with so much access to information and a prideful, arrogant belief that we can figure everything out and a prideful, arrogant belief that everything can be reduced and explained, and a prideful, arrogant belief that all things can be solved, and a prideful, arrogant belief that if we can just be educated enough, we can figure anything out. Mary doesn't have that pride or arrogance. And the scriptures does not agree with that. <laughs> the scriptures confront all those beliefs as prideful and arrogant. When we read about God, the scriptures, limits are placed on mankind and our knowledge and our wisdom and our ability and our power. The confession of Jesus as the Lord, as the Savior, as the judge, is the confession that we are not the measure of all things. Our brain is not the final authority, but we surrender, we trust, we submit to another. Jesus, who is the good king and who loves and values us, and, and Mary submits to God in the message of the angel. But she wrestles, she perplexed, she doesn't lose herself in it, but then she puts herself under it. Every one of you, me, all of us have to wrestle with this question. What is the ultimate measure of all things? We have to wrestle with the question, who is the ultimate authority? Who decides? C.S. Lewis says this, there's only uh, two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done or those to whom God says in the end, okay, thy will be done. Mary believes she has encountered something true, a God revealed truth, and she receives it as one under that word, a servant who says, here am I, servant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. Those are the perfect words for us to pray as we come to the scriptures, to do all the wrestling, all the questioning, but then say, here am I, servant, let it be according to your word. Mary knows her scriptures. What she says in this scene is similar to what Abraham says when God calls him. It's similar to what Moses and then Samuel, the great judge said uh, it, when, when God calls them and what the prophet Isaiah says. It's similar to what her son will say in the garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus will wrestle 
and question and be perplexed and be afraid. I would then say to God, okay, this is your path, not my will, but yours. If you're in Christ, if you know of his love and grace and lordship and salvation, it's because Jesus and his ancestors chose the word and will of God over their own rights and their own minds and what they thought was best. That's what Mary did as well. A Christian lives in the healing, flowing grace of surrendering to the will of God above our own. That's the decision that needs to be made to know the healing, saving power of Christ. You have to surrender to his love and gracious but terrifying will and authority over your life to experience his salvation and transformation. Until then, you're kicking against the goads. Until then, you're trying to make yourself the authority. And that's the same attitude we have to bring to the scriptures to be open to their work and authority in our lives. Not as a magical book, but as texts that point us to all that God the Father, Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit have to show us. Not as a magical book that helps us do whatever we want with our lives or that we can use to put under us, but as a revealing word showing us what it means to be human in the image of God. A revealing word that we submit ourselves to, to understand more about our origin, our purpose, and our destiny. To understand more about who God is. It's all pointed to in this book. Let's follow Mary. Here am I, let it be according to your word. When you come to these scriptures, when you come to prayer, when you come upon a new morning, be reminded of this posture. There will be temptations all day to say, my will, my word, my ways. Mary's stronger than you. She's smarter than you. She probably knows the Bible better than you. Look at her holy posture and model it. Here am I, the servant. Let it be with me according to your word. That's a terrifying prayer. <laughs> Start praying it as you pour over the scriptures. And then do one more thing. There's one last word from Mary. And I just love this last story I'm going to share today. It's in John chapter 2. Jesus shows up at a wedding in Cana and his family and his friends are all there. These weddings are huge parties that go on for a week. There is wine flowing day after day after day. The expectation is to feed lots and lots of people. Um, our culture is very different than the West. Uh, to give an example, uh, we have neighbors who are from India and they had a wedding in their village and they had to feed a thousand people and it was a multiple day thing. So anyway, that's what, what's happening. There's a big party going on. This wedding, the wine stops. There's no wine left, it gave out. This is a cultural disaster, a hospitality disaster. Shame for the family, you don't make this mistake. Mary sees the problem, she takes it to Jesus. Jesus kind of says to her, not my problem. <laughs> my time has not yet come. Well, let me share it. Let me read, read directly from the story. Mary says to Jesus, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother grabs the servants. Servants, it says. Mary says to the servants, and hear these words. Do whatever he tells you. So Jesus has the servants fill uh, 1,800 gallons of jars with water and he turns it into wine and the first uh, miracle happens and the wedding is saved. And look at what Mary said. She points to Jesus and says, do whatever he tells you. I love that word. Let's bring it to how we look at the scriptures, right? You wrestle with the scriptures, you're perplexed, you're pondered, you've treasured. And you say, here I am, a servant of the Lord, let it be according to your word. And then go do whatever he tells you to do. I would put these last two postures, quotes, written somewhere in your house. That word from Mary, that I'll let it be according to your word and do whatever he tells you to do. If you really want to simplify life and follow Jesus, wrestle, ponder, treasure, ask questions, but then pray and read the scriptures and talk about it in the church and then pray, here I am, a servant of the Lord, let it be according to your word. And then go do whatever he tells you to do. That's a good way to live as a follower of Jesus. If you could pray and mean those prayers, it would transform you and our church and those around us. Those are scary prayers. Those are scary, holy postures that I, I think are the prayers we should be praying as we meditate upon the good word of God. 
I began by telling you some stories of thrift store finds. Um, that woman who has the Jackson Pollock painting, she's now 85 years old. She rents a trailer home. The rent has gone up. She lives off a $1,000 Social Security check, which barely covers rent, and she panhandles on occasion. She refuses to sell the Jackson Pollock painting unless she gets a fair asking price. She spent 25 years holding on to it. She's turned down $9 million. She has a treasure and she's not doing anything with it. She has a treasure that is not bringing a tangible benefit to her, her loved ones, or the world. She is wasting that treasure. And that is us, and that is you, if you don't make use of these scriptures. And I'm not saying this to you if you don't believe this is the word of God, or you're unsure of what you believe about Jesus. Again, to you, boy, just take it up and read it. But if you're a Christian who believes this word is authentic, if it's a real word, then you're this woman if you don't make use of this treasure. That Pollock sits in her house every day. She has it. She looks at it. She never takes it and transforms it into something useful. That is you. That is me. If we sit and read this word, but then do not say, here am I, a servant of the Lord. Let it be according to your word. We are she. If we do not go forth, do what he tells us to do. There is treasure in these scriptures that will transform you and will move you to bring the goodness of God to others. Do not waste it. Treasure it. Receive it. Submit to it and do whatever it tells you to do. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your servant, Mary, and her willingness to receive and treasure the words you spoke to her the news you brought to her. We thank you for her faithfulness as a disciple, as well as uh, Mary we saw last week in Mary Magdalene. Lord, help us understand these scriptures. Help us use them. Help us trust them. Help us listen and obey. Um, Lord, help us be free to ponder them, to wrestle with them, to engage them. But Lord, teach us, teach us through them Holy Spirit, continue to move in us and as a church as we read them. Lord, for those with doubts, with those for questions, for those feeling overwhelmed with busyness, again, reveal yourself, move in them, guide them into space where they would commit to knowing your scriptures. Lord, move us into places where we continue to study and know these words in community and not just know them with our head knowledge, but embrace them, follow them, obey them and live out of them. We see that Jesus as the great example, living out what he knows in the scriptures and Mary also living out. She actually has Jesus and, and, and raises him and trusts him and in real life tells other people to go do what he's telling you to do. Uh, let it be like that for us. Lord, let us all be able to say with our lives, here am I, a servant of the Lord, let it be according to your word. Lord, help us pray the scary prayer, that scary prayer of submission to you. Lord, help us also hear Mary's word and go forth and do whatever you're telling us to do. It's in your name we pray. Amen. As we close out the service, we want to sing this prayer of blessing over you and your families. In these uncertain times, God is certain. And these words from Scripture give us a glimpse of God's heart for us. He cares for you. And right now, wherever, wherever we are, whatever we're going through, He's with us. The Lord bless you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. The 
The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you. to you. Lord, turn his face toward you and give you peace. That's right. Amen. 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 Now the benediction. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword as it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. 
No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And all God's people said, Amen.